Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Lane County Board of Commissioners meeting for this Tuesday, March 8th. I'd like to start off the meeting. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? I would mention that we do have a, an emergency business item that Mr. Kyler is going to uh, present to us under item four. Is there anything else? Okay. Seeing none, then we'll move to uh, public comments. So, seeing that we have no public comments this morning. Uh, on item three, commissioner's response to public comments and or issues and remonstrance. Do we have any remonstrance this morning? Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting that the, the uh, legislature voted to increase the minimum wage that the, uh, while Oak Ridge is unable to sustain a McDonald's, apparently Oak Ridge and Eugene are on the uh, same playing field. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Commissioner Swanson. Today is International Women's Day, and according to um, a, an economist in Portland, mm -hmm. in 2012, now this is 2012, not now, but in Oregon, for every Oregon. dollar a man made in the state of Oregon, a woman made 79 cents. That was approximately what it was five years earlier, and I think it's worth noting that today is International Women's Day. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of things really quickly. Our uh, Equity and Human Rights Task Force continues to meet. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow night, um, a continuation of the series of meetings that uh, Mr. Mokraisi set up in conjunction with, uh, with our uh, um, uh, uh, Human Resource Department, and uh, a number of people are going to be attending that. Also, I'd like to announce that next week, um, on uh, March 16th, there will be an uh, Equity and Human Rights Task Force community meeting that's going to be held. Uh, I believe that's going to be at um, the Campbell Community Center, and uh, that's going to begin next week at uh, 5.30 p.m. on uh, March 16th. Everybody's invited. Uh, the work that we're, going, that we're putting forward on uh, Equity and Human Rights is really significant. Uh, it's groundbreaking and monumental. I uh, look forward to the conclusion of that work. We have a couple more months' worth of work before we uh, bring a report to the, the administrator. The, uh, the second thing I will mention is that uh, I, I began to talk last week about uh, Occupy Medical. Um, didn't have much time because of the length of the meeting. Just wanted to point out that uh, every Sunday across the street from us in the park blocks, Occupy Medical sets up a, uh, a bus and a series of tents where they perform um, or provide medical services to men and women who otherwise would not have access generally to medical service as uh, typically emergency type service, foot care, some dental care, and some simple things like haircuts. They do it on a, on a shoestring budget. Uh, it's uh, privately funded. And uh, they, they operate um, every single Sunday over there for three to four hours. And uh, over the course of the last four months, I believe, is, in, is the time frame, they've, they've treated uh, about 3,000 people. 3,000 men and women who, once again, otherwise would not have gotten treated. And currently, we're uh, trying to find a place for them uh, to set up underneath cover so that each Sunday, when it's raining or when it's particularly hot, they don't have to take the time in the morning to set up the tents. It takes a couple of hours to set up the tents, a couple of hours to break down the tents. And that cuts into the service time that they're able to provide for the people who are showing up each Sunday morning. So if you happen to be downtown Eugene on Sunday morning and you see it's called the Occupy Medical Bus. It's parked on, on uh, Pearl Street, excuse me, on Oak Street, uh, right across uh, right across the uh, the um, 8th Street from us, they provide a tremendous service. Stop by and see Sue, Sue Sierra Lupe and uh, her staff. A lot of good things happening over there. And one last thing I'll mention is that we do have a project out in Bethel called Build a Better Bethel. I'll report on that more as we move down the road on building a better Bethel. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Commissioner Bozovich. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, you know, as long as we're recognizing things, don't forget today's National Pancake Day. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's kind of interesting, though, that the legislature, in passing their minimum wage law, recognizes there's a difference between the economy in Roseburg and the economy in Eugene, um, so that those folks washing dishes in the pancake restaurant will be paid different wages. Yet, for some reason, they think Mapleton and Oak Ridge have a better economic situation than Roseburg does. Uh, I just, you know, it's the insanity of drafting legislation in 35 days. 
that should never have been drafted in a 35-day short session. I would like to note that on uh, this Thursday evening at 6 o'clock at Mapleton High School, the Sayusaw National Forest will be holding a public meeting to review the Indian Creek landscape plan. This is a significant um, resource management plan being put forward uh, under a landscape management plan for a large area of West Lane County that includes significant road closures and denying public access to public lands. And I hope folks will show up and learn a little bit more about that from the Forest Service and provide some comments to the Forest Service on public access to public lands. Okay. All right. So with that, we'll move to uh, item four, emergency business. I'd like to ask Mr. Kyler to come forward. He has um, an item to discuss. Stewart, uh, members of the commission, I'm Alex Kyler, your intergovernmental relations manager. So uh, this, before you are, are a series of three letters to our federal delegation, um, this is an item that uh, came to my attention to, uh, via the Health and Human Services Department. Essentially what this, these letters are, are a request to our delegation to sign on to a House Dear Colleague letter and a Senate Dear Colleague letter that are being distributed in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, unfortunately, the due date for those letters is the 15th of March. Otherwise, I would have had this as regular part of the legislative update for next week. Um, but essentially, as you're aware, the federal, um, the Congress is building the uh, uh, federal budget right now, and the Dear Colleague letters are to the Appropriations Committees um, specifically to ask for full funding for health center monies. And since we have um, a number of health centers under our FQHC umbrella, um, staff reached out to me and asked that we draft this letter. So, Mr. Chair, I think how we've done these in the past is if they've come in front of you without review, I've simply read the letter and then would ask for a motion to support or amend the letter. Okay, great. So I'm going to read the, the one to Congressman DeFazio. Really, they're identical to the senators, save for who the contact people are for the respective chamber letters. So it reads, uh, Dear Congressman DeFazio, Lane County operates five primary care clinics, one school-based health center, and a behavioral behavior health center, including a methadone treatment program, and serves in excess of 30,000 patients at these facilities. We have opened two new clinics in the past two years, and these clinics have been especially important in our ongoing effort to both attract new primary care providers to our region and to serve those residents now more able to participate in preventative health care. Fully 86% of the program revenue is derived from Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial insurers. Grants comprise 10% of the program revenue, and the balance of revenue comes from patient payments. Of the insurance revenue, 95% comes from Medicaid alone. Community health centers represent approximately 20% of the Lane County budget dedicated for the delivery of health and human services. The grant for our federally qualified health center is approximately $2 million annually and is derived from the Health Resources and Services Administration. This funding primarily pays for Lane County's administration costs associated with running the FQHC. The grant is competitive and provides funding for three years. It is these dollars that we continue to watch closely as part of the federal funding picture, and we ask for your support in this effort. The passage of the omnibus budget bill in March 2015 avoided what was being termed the primary care cliff, and we want to take this opportunity to thank you for your support of that measure. As the federal budget process is now again underway, we write today to ask you to sign onto a funding support letter being prepared by Congressman Gene Green and Congressman Gus Bilirakis for delivery to the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies. The letter seeks continued support for the Health Center's program in FY 2017. It is our understanding that these contacts, that the contacts for these letters are Kristen O'Neill in Rep. Green's office and Kristen Seam in Rep. Billy Rock's office. 
Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Stuart Chair. So the Senate letters are almost identical, save for that last sentence about who the contacts are, or the last two sentences. Okay. So do we have a motion to support this letter and request? Move approval. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I'd just like to thank you, Alex, for bringing this before us today, and Dr. Ledke, and recognizing the importance of our clinics and the services that we provide and the funding for them. So any further comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Next is item five. It's kind of a new item that we schedule occasionally on the board. It's employee recognition. I look forward to these items as it's a great time to recognize some outstanding individuals in our organization. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Mokaiski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and appreciate the opportunity to share with you some great stories about our outstanding employees here in Lane County. So we're trying to do this at least once a month where we identify individuals, and there are a lot of opportunities for us to do this because we have a lot of great employees doing great work throughout Lane County. So it's difficult, of course, to recognize everybody, but we want to give you and the public an understanding of the work that's happening in our community. So first, we have three employees we're going to recognize today. I want to first invite up here Tony Fromke and Darren Crooks from Fleet Services. Come on up here, guys. And then Michael Johns is here. Mike, you want to come join us, our fleet, and have a seat? Get comfortable here for a second. We're going to talk about you and embarrass you for a moment. Tony and Darren rebuilt the blade. And you have a handout here. We provided this to the board in a picture of the piece of equipment because we thought it was interesting to share that with commissioners so you could get an idea of the size and scale of the equipment that we're talking about here. Tony and Darren rebuilt the blade on the waste management DAT crawler at the Glenwood Transfer Station in record time. They worked evenings and Saturday to get the crawler back to work in only two and a half days. We typically work with a local dealer. In this case, it would have taken about 10 days for that equipment to be repaired and cost about $1,700 or more. Actually, it would have cost the county nearly $1,700 more than it cost for the staff time for our employees to do that work even after the overtime was factored in. Tony and Darren took it a step further, and they also reinforced the blade to make it stronger and help lengthen its lifespan. And I wanted to just read a quote here from our senior solid waste supervisor, Greg Betts, who sent an email to the fleet services team thanking them, saying, thank you and your crew for the great work that was done on the pit cat arm blade repair. The Caterpillar dealer had estimated more than a week to do the job, which would have put us in a bad spot. With fleets planning, the work was completed in less than three days. Having the crawler down only a few days was a huge help to us and our operation. With the timing of the project, we were able to maintain our garbage pit with a D3 cat until the DAT was back up and running. Thanks again for the thoughtful planning and execution to complete the job in a timely manner. Your work is greatly appreciated. And I know, Commissioners, many of you have been out to the transfer station and seen this equipment in operation, and it's really, there's a science to it. And this equipment is critical to getting the work done and managing our waste and materials at our site. And so I want to just, on behalf of our organization, thank both of you. And, Michael, thank you for the great work that you and your team are doing to make sure that we have critical equipment available to provide outstanding services to the community. Thank you. So we have certificates here for Tony and for Darren. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. We won't put you on the spot if you want to say anything, please, or, Michael, if you have anything. No, I think the administrator covered it pretty well there. And we work great with our contractors downtown. We have a great relationship with them. But in this particular case, we were able to cut about seven days off of what they said it was going to take. And that seven days is critical for the waste management people. They would have had to use a smaller, less capable piece of equipment to fill the void. And these guys took care of it while still doing their regular day jobs, working at night and on the weekends to get this repair project done. So we really appreciate their work. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a good work. Thank you. And we have one more recognition, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nikki Maha. Nikki, I saw Nikki in the back. Come on up here and everyone, come on up and and join us here. Nikki is a uh, uh, property appraiser too, in assessment and taxation. Uh, she started at Lane County last July, and we actually did a training together, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Uh, when we were uh, both new employees. And uh, prior to Lane County, she worked as an appraiser in the Douglas County Assessor's Office. Um, I, I will say that uh, I know that one of the comments that you made early on in your time was how much you appreciated working here in Lane County and uh, what a great environment it has been for you. Uh, 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 and you've worked in other counties, uh, Douglas County in particular, so uh, we know that you're enjoying your time here. Um, in early January, uh, Mr. Coles, our assessor, uh, shared with e me an email. A gentleman emailed um, emailed Mike to let him know how much he appreciated Nikki's professionalism and kindness. And the backstory here is that the resident, and this was unsolicited, so uh, you know, not everybody takes the time to send an email to thank us for the work that we do. Um, and, but the backstory here is that the resident, uh, and he shared this in his email, reported. Uh, that he was recovering from recent eye surgery, uh, and Nikki took the time to explain in detail the appraisal process, evaluated his home uh, with his care helper, and answered all their questions patiently and in detail. And the quote from this individual that he sent in an email, uh, I believe he even sent a picture of his, uh, his license, is that right? That's correct. Uh, so he, he sent a lot of information about who he was and, and he wanted, he clearly went above and beyond to make sure that we were aware of his appreciation for the work that Nikki and, and the team in assessment and sex, taxation do. His quote was, if Lane County has a department where field representatives of any county department go to learn customer service, appraiser Maha should teach that class. She's a class act, and you were very fortunate to have her on your team. And I think we all agree with that. So thank you, Nikki, for the great work that you're doing. And we have a certificate for you here. And I don't know, Mike, if you have uh, anything you want to add. I just wanted to reiterate, Nikki, thank you very much. And uh, also, the entire department, we have some great employees. And I just wanted to uh, give recognition to the staff of A&T. Thank you. And this is always the challenge with recognizing individuals is you always leave people out, right? Uh, the reason that we've started doing this is we feel like it's really important to uh, provide symbols uh, that are representatives of uh, the larger group of employees who are out there doing great work. So I hope people can appreciate that uh, Nikki and Tony and Darren are examples of a lot of other people that we have in our organization who oftentimes go unnoticed, but they uh, live in our community, they pay taxes in our community, and they come here every day and they're committed not just to doing their job, but to making their community a better place uh, each and every day. So thank you again. Appreciate it and keep up the great work. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. All right, thank you. Okay. okay. Now we'll move to item six, which is our consent calendar. Uh, these items are, are considered to be routine and uh, they are to be uh, approved and uh, acted on in one motion. If there's an item that uh, commissioner is concerned about or would like more information, um, they're requested to be pulled off the consent calendar and then dealt with individually. So with that, uh, look, forward, look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. Commissioner Lycan. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move approval of consent, consent calendar. Second. We have a second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimous. All right, item seven is next. It is uh, order 16-03-08-05 in the matter of applying for and approving acceptance of a substance abuse and mental health services administration grant in the amount of 2400000 for a cooperative agreement to benefit homeless, net, homeless individuals, C-A-B-H-I grant for the period October First through 2016 through September 30th, 2019. Welcome, Morning. Mr. Manila. Um, Steve Manila, Department of Health and Human Services. Good morning, Chair Stewart and Board of Commissioners. This is an exciting opportunity. We have an opportunity to bring together 
a number of different aspects of our effort to help folks who are chronically homeless. Um, this uh, SAMHSA grant will enable us to build an infrastructure uh, to bring together our corrections, our public safety, our human services, our primary health care, and our behavioral health care uh, towards helping some of the most vulnerable people in our community, but also some of the folks that um, use more resources in our public systems than other people. So the concept here is that uh, SAMHSA will give us 800000 a year as a pilot to build the capacity towards serving uh, 175 uh, homeless individuals during the course of the grant. Yeah. Any questions or comments? I, I would say just before I turn to Commissioner Sorensen that the, uh, this item was actually scheduled to be on the consent calendar and the agenda team felt that it was important to uh, highlight it as uh, mental health and also the homeless. Uh, items are two critical areas that this board is focused on and we really wanted to show the, and uh, what our staff is working towards trying to improve our, our current services to those two areas. So with that, Commissioner Sorensen. Hi. Uh, Mr. Minnell, I was wondering, uh, is this a step towards a housing first um, policy that the cities and the county and others are moving toward? Yes, um, the um, Poverty and Homelessness Board is in the process of approving a strategic plan, but we're also working on putting in place 150 units of um, housing first, low barrier housing for folks with mental illness, substance abuse issues. Um, the idea of housing first is uh, to be able to screen people in. A lot of these people end up getting screened out and are unable to be housed. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Farr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manella, I apologize for bringing you in this morning, <laughs> but uh, I thought it was important that you had a chance to come and talk specifically about this. It was, as, uh, Mr. as the Chair mentioned, originally on the consent calendar, but it seems so momentous in nature that uh, we are actually receiving the amount on a regular basis and the, the direction that we're, uh, that we're going. Commissioner Sorensen mentioned Housing First. We're going to hear a lot more about Housing First as the Poverty and Homelessness Board explores what's happening in other communities, other states, and how to maximize our uh, the dollars that we spend on housing men and women in our community. Um, we could talk about that for a long time, and at some point in the not too distant future, we will. But uh, thank you very much for bringing this to us today. And uh, Steve, I, I got this in the, uh, an email from uh, Margaret Salazar in the in the mail this morning. Have you taken a look at that? No, I haven't. It's uh, 22.4 million dollars for homeless programs here in Oregon, the, the Tier One Continuum of Care Grant. And, ah, uh, and uh, in Lane County is on the list. Lane County is uh, high to at the top of the list with um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven projects funded, uh, including um, including a, a significant significant amount of uh, of resources going to our HAXA program. Fantastic. And I know that you put a great deal of work into this in coordination. And uh, if you wanted to, if you had a moment or two to just explain what uh, what we're receiving here. Uh, the uh, the $2.4 million uh, in the continuum of care is to support our ongoing efforts around homelessness. And um, I need to acknowledge uh, Pearl Wolf on our staff. Uh, she writes this grant on an annual basis. It allows us to maintain our efforts serving homeless families, children, and folks with mental illness. Thank you, and, and I know probably most of us here have served on the Human Services Commission at, uh, Committee at some point uh, during our, our elective offices, and knowing that uh, the Human Services Commission does a, uh, the job of managing the continuum of care grant and distributing it to the, uh, the nonprofit agencies throughout the county who are, rely on the county to re receive really what is their front line of funding. And that includes uh, um, St. Vincent de Paul of Lane County and, uh, and uh, other um, other uh, non-profits in, in, uh, in our community. As far as this money goes, predominantly to HACSA and St. Vincent de Paul, but uh, good job bringing money in from the outside to leverage assistance to the people who need it the most in our community, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay. Commissioner Bozovich. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to clarify for the public here, Steve, this particular grant with um, 
that we're looking at approving the board order for today. That's a new set of funding for Lane County. This isn't a re-up of, of an existing grant. Correct. So I just I, I want want the public to understand that because sometimes <laughs> you know quite often we're approving just what is a continuation of a grant. This is actually a new uh, source of funding to address these particular issues. Uh, you know, substance abuse and mental health in our homeless population. We all know that our homeless population tends to be most in contact with the criminal justice system. It's shown that. 60% of our intakes at Lane County Jail have a mental health or substance abuse issue. And if you get into the Muni courts and the Muni jails, it's probably even higher for some of the misdemeanor behaviors that folks get arrested for. So this is really about trying to address that up front and maybe divert some of these folks to the proper level of care rather than into our criminal justice system. So it's not just about, um, you know, uh, health and Human Services. This actually has impacts down down the line for a lot of other programs. If we can get these folks uh, early treatment and and early uh, stabilization, so I really appreciate what your what your department's done and 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 Health and Human Services in getting this new revenue stream to to address this particular issue. Other comments? And I would entertain a motion to approve order 16-03-08-05. So moved. Second. Okay. Further discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And passed unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you Steve, much. for being here. Um, item 8 is uh, County Council. Do you still, we don't have any announcements? Or? We do have an executive session this afternoon at 1.30. Okay. Uh, item 9, County Administration. Yes. I think I can do it in a couple of announcements before our 9.30. Uh, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chair. Just a couple very brief announcements. I had the opportunity yesterday to speak to the Springfield Lions Club uh, and enjoyed that. They asked me to come and talk about the budget process in Lane County, and uh, I brought uh, uh, two of our favorite charts, one that uh, shows the past uh, 15 years of federal funding decline in the general fund and road fund. Um, and the other that ta uh, talks about the additional beds in the jail that we're now at 317 uh, local jail beds uh, as a result of the, the levy, the five-year local option levy that was approved in 2013. So we had a good discussion about challenges and opportunities in our budget, and I think the message was well received uh, by that group. A lot of questions about marijuana, interestingly. Uh, a lot of interest just in what's happening there and the impacts locally and how we're handling that and tax revenue and all those kind of things. Uh, the other thing, I, just a quick update, we, uh, there was an effort last year, and, and Commissioner Bozovich, as the chair last year, had a real focus on resiliency and emergency preparedness, and I just wanted to share with the board that we're continuing our discussions to make sure that we are um, regularly planning. You know, emergency preparedness is not something that we do. Just like a strategic plan, you develop it and then it sits on the shelf and you just wait for something to happen. It's something that we need to continually uh, focus on and have conversations about. So Linda Cook from the Sheriff's Office and our uh, executive team and a number of managers met to talk about what we can do to coordinate and plan and do trainings and scenarios. We're going to bring that discussion to our management team um, and continue to include the board, obviously, uh, in those efforts. But I just wanted to, uh, to remind the board that we continue those discussions around emergency preparedness, um, and we'll continue to provide you updates. Finally, I wanted to make a note uh, uh, today uh, that uh, Mr. Schusler, Howard Schusler, is in the audience, and many of you know Howard is our Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, he's been with Lane County for 14 years, and uh, he uh, recently announced that he accepted a position with the Lane Council of Governments. Uh, good for them. Uh, we're sorry to see Howard go. He's uh, provided great service to Lane County and to our community, and uh, we're glad that he's going to be remaining in the community with LCOG and uh, doing great work with Brenda Wilson and her team over there. So thank you, Howard, for all of your efforts, all your work in public works and in our community. We're going to miss you, and we wish you uh, all the best. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Not seeing any. Then we'll move to uh, item B. It's a 9.30 time certain. I'd like to uh, welcome Representative C Cedric Hayden, our uh, representative for District 7. Uh, if you'd like to come on up. And also with him is uh, Randy Meyer, 
Uh, they are with. They are here today to talk about their Caring Hands Worldwide uh, effort. And before I do that, I'd just like to uh, personally thank uh, Representative for the great work uh, you've done representing uh, the folks in uh, Lane County and East Lane County and down in the uh, Douglas County area. You've done a great job, and I appreciate your hard work. And. Uh, get to hear a wonderful effort that uh, I believe you've started and uh, Randy has uh, worked on uh, in providing some wonderful care to uh, the citizens here in need in Lane County. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, you or Randy. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that very much. I'll let uh, Randy start and then I'll close. Okay. I've brought extra copies of the uh, proposal uh, and left them in the back for the public as well as the copies that you have in front of you. Caring Hands Worldwide is a uh, nonprofit organization based in Fall Creek, just outside of Lowell. Um, we've been in existence for uh, since 2007, and we've been providing uh, free dental care both here in Lane County, Chuuk, Micronesia, uh, Zambia, and uh, Madagascar now. We just opened a clinic there in that country. And uh, we're very excited about doing rural services here. We've been going to Oak Ridge, to uh, Springfield, to Eugene, and to um, areas out up, including the McKinsey um, track. We went there and provided dental services right outside the track there up the McKinsey River. Um, recently, this last year, we started a new event called Impact Your Health Eugene. Impact Your Health Eugene is an event that uh, was made up of 200 individuals who volunteered. We had doctors who answered medical questions. We had nurses who did medical evaluations. We had uh, trained people who did uh, lifestyle counseling training for low income and uh, pe people from Lane County, veterans included. And uh, we also provided chiropractic services, um, uh, massage therapy, haircuts, and um, dental services, as well as we had the Casey Ivan uh, come down from Portland OHSU University. They provided free eye exams in their mobile clinic. We had Rainbow Optics here locally who provided free um, eye exams. Uh, we had uh, doctors here in town that provided free cataract surgery for local residents. All in all, we saw 1,000 people during the event. Uh, we pro provided post-event um, surgery. Um, some people who had severe cataracts are now able to see who live here in Lane County and would have not otherwise been able to afford such care. So our view and our perspective is that we see our services as a vital part of the community providing half a million dollars in services. And we're expanding our services. In um, March uh, 26, just a couple weeks away out in Fall Creek, we'll have a breakfast for veterans. And we have dentists and hygienists who will be providing free dental care to veterans who don't have any benefits through VA or through other dental insurance. And I've left copies of that flyer on the back as well. Because we see the high need of serving our veterans as well as our low-income individuals within our community. Um, we're here to present and ask the um, Commissioner Board to consider the possibility of helping us with this. Previously, we were in the Willer Pavilion. It was much too small. We were quite compacted, as you can see from the photo there in the proposal. We're looking at using the Performance Hall. Um, I've spoken with Ron. Eagleston, and um, we have reserved the performance hall for October 15th and 16th for the event this year. And we hope to serve well over a thousand people and provide well over half a million dollars in services during that event. And uh, we thank you for considering our proposal. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cedric Hayden. I am state representative from House District 7. Uh, I am here in the capacity of a founder of Caring Hands Worldwide. Thank you, Chair Stewart and uh, committee members uh, for having us here today to present this to you. As you're aware and uh, <clears throat> conversations prior to us, resources are very scor uh, scarce in uh, the realm of helping the low income, and so we always want to stretch dollars as much as we can to provide the, the maximum uh, amount of services for the dollars that we have available. And so when we reach out to communities, we look for partnerships. Randy's mentioned many partnerships that we have uh, been able to put together for the Impact Your Health here in Lane County. We think it was a very 
a good success, a very good benefit for the community. And uh, even though the Wheeler Pavilion is pretty good size, it was too small for us. And so really just to recap what Randy's saying here is we would like the opportunity to expand on uh, that program that we did last year, uh, have a little more robust program, trying to bring in more health care providers, um, uh, you know, physical health, mental health, oral health, uh, nutritional counseling, um, and another program that I'm working on is bringing in uh, some uh, free legal assistance for people to help them with some of the, the uh, applications that we have uh, to help them find services uh, in, addition to, in, in addition to the nonprofit world. So we try and make a connection between uh, services that might be available for them that they would qualify through the state and services uh, through nonprofit organization. So the ask is uh, for you to consider donating uh, the, uh, the larger um, performance hall that we might have uh, some activity to this after this, this fall. Uh, in, uh, in anticipation of that, um, if, if we could get that approval, we would set up to plan a little more robust, robust uh, organization or uh, planning that we did uh, last year. We do uh, continue to have services um, monthly, weekly. Um, uh, out in the communities, like Randy mentioned, Oak Ridge, we're very, very close to placing a um, unit there or a dental container there with Orchid Health. Uh, those negotiations are going on. That's a community that's been hard hit uh, over the years with loss of um, timber resources. Uh, and so in, in, for organizations to come in and backfill those resources for medical needs is very important. So I uh, just ask for your consideration. Okay. One other uh, quick story I'd like to share with you. This little girl came to impact her health. She hadn't had glasses in over three years. Uh, she could not see very well. She wasn't able to do well in school. She came, went to Rainbow Optics, got her glasses. She's doing much better in school, according to her grandma, who sent me a letter. And I just want to let you know how it impacts even the smallest members of our community. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Lycan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Chair, refresh me a little bit on, uh, or maybe Steve, if you could as well, um, about uh, do we, I think we have some sort of policy in place about whether we donate or not, because I th my feeling is if we were to donate here, probably several other groups would want us to donate as well. But I would be willing, though, instead, and um, – uh, maybe we can have Diana pull this up. I'd be willing instead to provide money out of our commissioner's fund to offset the cost okay. so that there's, so there's not an actual, instead of the county donating the land that uh, I would be interested in, and maybe my colleagues would be interested in doing the same thing. I'll have to have Diana pull up my, I, my account. I don't know how much I have right now, but I'll have her pull up my account. But I'd be interested in, in donating. And then if we could, you know, if all five of us have interest, we could maybe be able to even that out. And then uh, that way there's no issue of, of the county donating, but instead the board stepping up instead dealing, uh, offsetting the cost. So that's, I'm interested in doing that. And, uh, and I'll ask Diana to take a look at at least my account specifically. And, I'll listen to my colleagues. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Mokaiski, you want to address the question there? Sure. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Lykin, uh, we have not had the practice in the past of, and I don't believe there have been, to my knowledge, there have not been any examples where we have uh, donated the use of uh, uh, building at the Lane Event Center. And I would say there have been cases, certainly uh, in the last few years, we've worked with the Egan Warming Centers to provide, uh, to make available uh, the Wheeler Pavilion at the Lane Events Center, uh, but we do charge for that cost. Now, what we do in that case is we look at what the bare cost is to open the facility and provide the staffing there. So I think, um, you know, potentially if, if uh, the rest of the commissioners are interested in, in Commissioner Likens' proposal, we could also sit down um, uh, with the requesters and look at, okay, what are the basic costs to provide this facility um, and how can we, you know, come up with a proposal that would be, uh, um, that would be as reasonable as possible. It's just a great cause. That's how I feel about it. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was going to mention the same thing. You know, last year I turned in well over $1,000 worth of my uh, personal fund and uh, I'd much rather spend it on something 
that, uh, such as this that uh, providing direct benefit to people who need it the most, including the young lady, the young girl. Do, what, how old is she? Did you, do you know that right off the top? I believe she was like 12. 12. So that's you can't put a price tag on that. You know, that's pretty remarkable. So thank you for looking into that, Mr. Markowski, and thank you, Commissioner, for bringing it up. I just received my answer from Diana. <laughs> that was quick. Mr. Bozovich? <laughs> I'm not quite done. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Um, this is a great example, uh, Representative Hayden, of uh, uh, agencies working back, inter intergovernmentally working back and forth. Just three weeks ago, I was sitting in that chair, and you were sitting in this chair, and I was uh, asking you for assistance with our veterans' uh, housing funds. And you uh, you provided great testimony, and you provided uh, your your uh, committee as a uh, uh, Representative Kenny Geyer's committee, the Health and Human Services Committee, that uh, put forward the uh, the proposal that we'd asked for. I was there with uh, Cameron Smith from the ODVA, and uh, and we we got the request. It went through the House, went through the Senate, was signed by the governor. And thank you very much for that happening. So I think uh, when agencies work together, that's when the public can be assured that their money is being spent absolutely the most efficiently that it can possibly be spent. I really uh, I took a few moments to recognize this, re recognize the uh, caring hands. Uh, briefly at, at the, at the uh, committee meeting and, uh, and wanted to make sure that people sitting up there knew that you were performing duties far, far beyond your legislative duties to take care of the people once again who need help the most in our community. Thank you very much, Representative Hayden. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, I, I do support the idea of looking at, at um, utilizing our office um, funds to possibly support this. It's not without precedence. We did the same thing for, for some gap funding for the Egan Warming Center um, about a year or so ago uh, when they and, you know, were having a particularly tough winter um, and, and we provided uh, $4,000 out of our office funds for that. One thing I will note is the Lane Events Center operates as an enterprise fund. So they have to be self-supportive. We don't have the ability necessarily to donate, you know, for that fund. Um, you know, it, it's it has to break even. So if we choose to tell them not to charge you guys, we have to either pull money from our general fund or some other place to make up that that amount. We can't really just waive a fee. One of the questions I have, and and. Uh, you know, I see Marsha out there, and, uh, and, and Mr. Mokrice, you might be able to answer this. Have we discounted any other events out there? I mean, we've had stand downs at the event center. Um, you know, I, I, like you were just talking about the warming center, but I just, I, you know, I'm a little bit leery about how we, you know, set president. You know, that's one of the reasons why the office fund might work well for this. But I just want to, you know, understand, you know, what has been our past practice? Yes, we. Um, I'll take a shot at that, and if I'm off base or Marsha wants to add anything, she can jump up here. But uh, it, it's my understanding that we have discounted, and so I shared the Egan Warming Center as, as an example um, where we've said, look, this is a local, nonprofit, vol largely volunteer-based organization that's providing an outstanding community service, as this organization is. Um, we do have some costs, so let's just look at what the bare costs are. So in that case, the Egan Warming Center is in. And there may be others that uh, that fit that mold where they're local, nonprofit, service-based, volunteer-run organizations that don't have a lot of resources that we've worked with to discount the cost and recover truly the bare minimum of, of what would be necessary. And that's what we're proposing uh, to do here if the commissioners uh, would like us to do that is to work. Um, uh, with this organization to identify what what those costs would be and then uh, determine what um, where the balance you know would be paid from yeah, and I guess the other thing I'd, I kind of like to understand um, is is that particular time period a, a heavy booking period for the that performance hall or is this this a a day that normally it wouldn't be in use anyhow, because I think one of the things about the the, the wheeler using the wheeler pavilion, we were using it um, offering on when it wasn't already booked for a paying event. Um, you know, so there's a little bit of a you know a, a kind of understanding that um, a bit. Um, I would you know like to close just by saying I would uh, if you guys would work with the, the local Lions clubs, um, you know, because they can bring a, a sight and hearing. Uh, uh, to, to your event also for basically for zero cost, and then they can connect those folks with eyeglasses and all that. We did have the Lions present. 
Okay. And I'm a member of the Lions Club as well. And okay. We too. <laughs> as am I. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Commissioner Sorensen, did you? I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, on the topic of of your program, it, it really is amazing. I think it's phenomenal that uh, you know. In rural Lane County, we have the headquarters of an international program that tries to help people with their health problems. I think that's great. And um, for you, Representative Hayden, I had the fortune of serving with Representative Hayden, another Representative Hayden, I think it's your father. Yes. Yeah. And I know that uh, it's a busy uh, life to be a citizen legislator. and. So I want to commend you for your involvement with this program and leadership. Um, on the uh, Lane County budget problem, uh, I might suggest we look into uh, the board contingency. And if that isn't sufficient um, to um, offset the cost that the Lane Event Center staff computes to be a reasonable cost, um, that we look further, and uh, that could include the the uh, funds that are appropriated by the county for the uh, use of the commissioners. So I probably would go in the order of what's the board contingency and how much does uh, Lane Event Center need. Uh, is this a multiple day program, or how long does it last? It's a two day. Two program. days. I know that one big factor in the uh, in the pricing will be the the days, because the weekends are usually more competitive, and yet that's also maybe a, the best days to pick. But a compromise on that would be maybe Thursday, Friday, or Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, Monday. Um, but I'll leave that to the people that are doing the scheduling and have a better idea of what's available. I know that we have over 300 events there annually, so uh, there's a lot of people that, that use that space in different ways. Yes. Thank you so much for your great work. Okay. Um, so, so with that, uh, it sounds like we have support and direction, hopefully, uh, from the board to do what we can to find a way to uh, reimburse the fair for the event center for the cost of the two-day event that you're going to do. It sounds like it's already booked or, or reserved, right? Sure. That's correct. So um, so I, I would, whether it's uh, individual commissioner's accounts or the board contingency combined with, um, um, you know, um, some sort of a, maybe you've already got a discounted rate, but we can work with the fair and see what the true costs are and, and make sure that we can have this event take place. So make that commitment to you. I, I would, you know, not challenge, but I'd not like to say that it's well worth your time that when uh, they have their portable uh, dental unit, those um, containers out in the community providing service, if you can become aware of those dates and, and have a moment to go take a tour, it's really, really uh, impressive what they've done with these cargo containers. Um, we've talked about them as maybe um, uses for uh, short-term uh, housing for for folks, but uh, it was my understanding, uh, Representative Hayden, that you worked with local companies and uh, were able to design and build this unit, and, and it's portable. They just take it up and set it up in, in a matter of hours, and they're up providing services. So. If um, you have the time to go out and, and view those, I think it's well worth seeing what's produced, created, and, and the services provided uh, to our community through that facility. So um, <laughs> with that, I, I don't know if there's – is there any other comments or questions? Just a quick question. The data is set for the 15th and 16th. Is that correct, of, of yes. Uh, October? Yes. And uh, – okay. And, and I would say that, you know, I really – I'm very, very supportive of this effort. Um, years ago, um, myself and um, I believe Mayor Lykin when he was mayor and, and Mayor Piercy, we, uh, we got involved in what we call Project Homeless Connect, and this is really the same similar type of an event where we're connecting with 
people that desperately need services in one location, we can, uh, we're helping people that, that um, are in, in desperate need. The executive summary of the uh, Homeless Connect is what we used as our model to establish yeah. this great. from 2011. Yeah, so it's great that you're able to bring this back and offer it up because, you know, a thousand people served or more. I think we at one time had a couple thousand people that uh, we were able to do, but it was it was a huge event. I think we used almost the entire fairgrounds at one time. So I, I, I greatly appreciate your compassion and your willingness and desire to serve the people in need in our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I might add that uh, there will be clinics that I will personally be working in March 11th. That's this Friday and uh, March 25th uh, here in Springfield, if anybody would like uh -huh. to come. Just observe. Uh, we'd, we'd enjoy you to stop by. Uh, it's in Springfield. Randy could give you the exact address location. Uh, one point about the scheduling and weekends, it does make it, uh, I know that's an important time and a, a time that people want to get, but it also makes it much easier for us to recruit health care professionals on weekends versus during the week. So, thank you. So, so Mr. Myers, if you could send that, uh, those dates that Okay. The representative then, or you could send them to me, okay. Cedric, and then I'll disperse them to the colleagues, okay. and maybe we'll see somebody show up, see your handiwork. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, we'll move to um, item 10, which is a report on uh, climate, climate change policies, environmental impacts, and best management practices. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Johns our fleet services manager and environmental guru to the table. So, Mr. So, Chair, I'll just make a couple introductory comments while, while Michael gets uh, set up here. Uh, so we had a discussion with the board in October 2014, and the board asked that we come back with annual updates and discussion about the work that we're doing related to best management practices and, and climate impacts. So we're here to do that today. Mr. Johns has done a great job taking the lead on this effort and uh, put together this report and this presentation um, that will cover a number of areas. So we want to just you know make it clear that we're going to be talking about um, vehicle uh, efficiency, uh, recycling and waste management, facility improvements, and other areas throughout Lane County where we've made a number of investments over a number of years. I thought I would also just add here, uh, we did an employee newsletter recently and we shared the, um, the, the amount of uh, recycled material from Lane County employees, 122,000 pounds of paper, 41,684 pounds of, uh, of shred, uh, 257 pounds of plastic, 4,711 pounds of electronics, uh, the equivalent of nearly 1,400 trees being saved, uh, the equivalent of removing 128 cars from the road for a year, saving energy equivalent to 18,000 gallons of gasoline, and eliminating uh, hauling 377 cubic yards of waste to the landfill. That's just within our organization among our employees um, and, and doesn't include all of the other areas. So just uh, for example, some of the impact that we're having uh, in our recycling programs within our organization. And then I would finally say uh, Brian Craner is here, Dan Hurley, has joined us. Uh, uh, David Risser is here, who may be able to, uh, he's new, so we'll try not to put him on the spot, may be able to talk about transportation uh, improvements as well. So waste management facilities, uh, fleet, uh, and, uh, and other operations are ready to take questions. Good morning again, Commissioners. Uh, Michael Johns, the Fleet and General Services Manager, with our yearly update of our best practices in the area of sustainability. And I'm joined, as the Administrator said, with uh, transportation plan and waste management and capital projects. As you know, sustainability isn't one person's responsibility here in Lane County. We have a lot of people uh, doing a lot of good work, so they're here to answer any questions also. If you remember back the last time I appeared before you, we gave kind of a big picture uh, look at what we were doing in this area with a lot of different moving parts. We covered some legislation and then, then we got into the weeds of what we were doing in particular areas. Um, this year, I'm going to give, I'm going to focus a lot more uh, directly on one particular thing that we've just recently started doing because of the dramatic impact it's made on our carbon footprint. Uh, and that's the use of renewable diesel in our fleet. I'll have a few slides to get into exactly what that means in a minute. Um, 
but basically a little background. I'm, I'm on the board of directors of the Columbia Willamette Clean Cities Coalition, which is an adv advocacy group for alternative domestic domestically produced fuels for transportation. And we started hearing some rumblings from coming out of California about this renewable diesel and what great product it is. So we're working with the, the Oregon Department of Energy and our partners at eWeb and the city of Eugene. We got together and said, well, why don't we try to get a pilot project using this product up here in Oregon. It never been used up here before. We were the very first people to have it imported and used here. California is quite popular. Their uh, requirements are quite stricter than the rest of the country, and they've been using it with great success. We worked with some contractors. They said, yeah, we can bring some of that up for you. It's all, all the fuel right now, renewable diesel used in California is imported from Singapore. So it comes from Singapore to California, and then they've been bringing it up since September in a barge to Portland for us. So that is factored into the carbon intensity. So uh, we do take that in consideration. It's not domestically produced anywhere on the West Coast right now. It is produced in several refineries in Louisiana, but that's all sucked up by the East Coast market. Um, our goal here is kind of to create a demand uh, and I hope that we can get this used by more fleets in the area, and we've done a lot of work in that department, and I'll get into that uh, also. So first, a little background about what a renewable diesel is. Well, what it isn't. Renewable diesel is not biodiesel, which we're all familiar with, and it's various forms, and we've been using it for quite a while. Renewable diesel dramatically increases our carbon intensity reductions that we can achieve over biodiesel. Biodiesel has some, some issues that, that uh, the way it's made proves difficult for us to use in all applications. You see up here in the slide, I put, I figured Commissioner Prostovich particularly would enjoy these slides being an engineer. This is how diesel, a very cartoonish rendering of how diesel is made uh, using crude oil as the feedstock that goes into it. And then you get your various, from the top is the lightest things and working all the way down to asphalt. You see diesel now down near the bottom. So this is, this is the process that we use to, well, the manufacturers use to make diesel. This is how uh, biodiesel is made, completely different process. And what happens during this process, an extra oxygen molecule, from what I understand, is added, which leads to some of the problems we have with uh, cloud points and being able to attract water, completely different process. And here's renewable diesel. And if you, that looks exactly like the first slide I showed you on petroleum-based diesel, because it is exactly the same. exactly the same process. The only thing different is the feedstock that's going into it. There's a number of feedstocks that can be used, any vegetable oil, or in our case, most of what we're getting is actually from sheep tallow from Australia and New Zealand. So this is what they're making this fuel out of. But you can see it gets the same type of products. Right now, we're only the only fuel that we can use using this process is diesel. But from what I understand, the naphtha up there will be the equivalent of gasoline and hopefully that will pass the standards uh, test that we need to get done so we can use that down the road also. All this renewable diesel meets or exceeds the ASTMD 975 standard, which you have to have to use in any engine. Uh, back when biodiesel first <coughs> came onto the scene, the manufacturers, the truck manufacturers, would get, I would say their support was would range from tepid down to hostile for using biodiesel in their engines. What we've heard from the manufacturers about renewable diesel is they're completely supportive of its use, and it's turning out to be a very good product and actually exceeds, in some areas, petroleum-based diesel in performance. <coughs> Here's a chart. I'm going to just concentrate on a couple of these numbers. It's kind of busy. It has different carbon intensities in pounds of CO2 equivalents per diesel gallon equivalent. So the lower the number, the better the number in that area is what you want to look at. So I've highlighted B5, B20, and R99 down at the bottom. The R99 is the renewable diesel. B5 and B20 are different blends of the biodiesel that we've been using in the county. So if you look at the very bottom, the R99, it's over a 68% reduction in carbon intensity 
from ultra low cell ultra low sulfur diesel which is the baseline that we're using where b20 was about a nine percent reduction and b5 was a little just a little over two percent reduction so you can see the dramatic difference in the carbon intensity reductions by using this product i also threw out there this is those dollar figures, $1.20 and $1.61 and $1.24, those are the figures I got from our procurement specialist last Wednesday on what we are paying for these products currently. So you can see that $1.24 per gallon for this renewable diesel is dramatically lower than $1.61 that we would be paying for B20 with a much greater reduction in our carbon intensity. Here's some of the, just of the more technical uh, aspects of renewable diesel, biodiesel, and regular petroleum-based diesel compared. Cetane is a number that's kind of equivalent to the diesel equivalent of uh, octane and gasoline. But uh, a lot of the other properties, the emissions are a lot lower for um, the renewable diesel. i get some figures on that. The uh, the problem with the cold flow properties, which is a major drawback for biodiesel, is actually better in renewable diesel than it is petroleum-based diesel. The uh, other reductions in emissions, particulate matter for renewable diesel is 33% lower. NOx, nitrogen oxide emissions are 9% lower. Carbon monoxide emissions are 24% lower, and hydrocarbon reductions are 30% lower. So you can see that this product has a lot of, uh, of really beneficial aspects. And also, if, whether you understand this slide or not, performance-wise, it's as good or better than petroleum-based diesel. So we're very excited about using this product. And fleet managers in general are not really big on change. and uh, this product has really outperformed our wildest expectations. Now, I put this slide up here. I used uh, 2014 as the full, last full year of figures I had for how much fuel we used and what our carbon footprint was. This is for our fleet. So we used 195,000 gallons of gasoline, E10, ethanol, 10% blend, and diesel B5, 338,000 gallons. You see in the right-hand column, we produce our carbon footprint was 60, a little over 6,800 tons, short tons of carbon uh, equivalents from our fleet. Now I use those same exact figures, but I used what it would be in if we had been using R99, the renewable diesel product for the entire year of 2014. And you can see it's 3386 short tons, which is over a 50% reduction, which is in our world is considered a pretty dramatic reduction in what we're, what we're doing. Now we're taking some efforts to get the word out about this. Like I said, City of Eugene, eWeb, and Lane County, we've already gotten some national press and different publications about our efforts in this area. We're, we're very proud of. I held a, Lane County held a a fuel summit in January for Lane County fleet managers to get the word out about this. I'm speaking at a conference, a uh, green transportation summit and expo in Tacoma next month about the same uh, thing that's directed towards fleet managers to get them on board. What we're really trying to do here is just get the word out, let people make their own decisions, and we're trying to get the demand up for this product. We've had a lot of really good response from the contractors. We work with the Jerry Browns and Tyree Oil, who we get our fuels from. They've signed up right away to get this fuel down here from Portland for us. They're storing it in a tank down here now for us. It's been working out really well. What we need to do is to get the demand up so at some point, maybe one of the West Coast refineries, hopefully in Washington, where most of our fuel comes from, almost all of our fuel comes from, will take it on to start producing this fuel. I don't know what feedstock they possibly would use compared to what they're using in, in uh, Singapore right now, but there's a lot of different feedstocks they could possibly make it out of. So we're just trying to get the word out there. We've already signed up some other partners. EPUD, I just learned yesterday, is using it now. LTDs, we had them at the summit. They're talking about coming on board. So if we can get a lot of these different fleets on board, it's really going to pump up demand, and hopefully the manufacturers will see the type of demand out there and get it uh, produced domestically for us here on the West Coast.
that this is recapping who some of the people that we were working with to get this off the ground. Like I said, the Oregon Department of Energy has been a great partner getting us in touch with the people in California who could get the fuel up here for us. And EWEB and City of Eugene and Lane County have really worked to get this off the ground. City of Portland, I must mention, also jumped in at the last minute when we got our first load at the end of September, and they've been using it exclusively also. Uh, uh, Portland and, and EWEB got their first load at the end of September. We got our first First load at Delta Shops in the first week of October, and then early December, I think we switched over since we saw what a great product it was to all the fuel we're using now is exclusively the R99. Um, just with those people up there, uh, there's 26 million pounds of carbon that we can reduce, but we're already adding more since I made this slide. We're already adding more fleets that are, are willing to use this. I know Deschutes County is using it. We're meeting constantly with more people. They're getting very excited about this. So we hope this will really take off and become a, a, a more widespread use in the fleet. Um, and I won't take any questions on this um, before we get into any of the other areas. But this is a pretty big development that I wanted to focus on today for this area. Mr. Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that, that's actually a pretty good uh, list right there. And uh, I guess the question I want to ask you, so I see Clark County uh, Public Utility Districts. So I'm assuming that's Clark County, Washington. That is. That's correct. Uh, uh, EWEB, our partners at EWEB, he, he has good contacts with all the fleet management for the utilities on the West Coast, and that's okay. how we get them involved. So who else in the state of Washington then is moving towards this? Do you, do you have that information available? Because when you mention the refinery, right. the question I would have is that, you know, and I do understand that's where we get them, but that's where our processed fuel comes from is the refinery there in, in right. Cherry Hills, I think is what right. it's called. There's, I think there's four refineries up in yeah. Washington. Yeah, <clears throat> so there's a, there's a major one up there, and, and every time they have, they need to uh, stop for a month for maintenance. Whichever season. Our price goes season. up. So, um, But the question I have if, if, uh, is if there's other – Communities, if the state of Washington is is going on this, if you you have that information, the reason why I ask is because that's where the fuel's coming from. Does it make sense from a financial cost for them to be able to uh, make sure that that fuel comes down here, and they're going to continue to make money? Because the one thing I found out about Washington, they do care about green and having you know and and and, and making sure the environment's taken care of, but they also understand this green, right? And sometimes. Our folks in Salem don't quite understand this green all, all the time, so that's why I ask that. Well, that's one of the areas that we're, <coughs> excuse me, that we're working on, and that's why I'm going to Tacoma next month, as we're getting meeting with other fleet managers to increase the demand. I'm not sure. I can find out who else is up there is using I'd it right curious. now. I'd be curious. It's mainly right now is California where it's all coming from. There's quite a bit of people, right. uh, uh, fleets down there, they are using it. It's a great product. It's working out really well for them. So that's exactly what we're trying to do, though, is increase the demand here. So. Let me backtrack for a minute because I've given you this rosy picture, and it would be uh, I wouldn't be doing my duty if I couldn't look down on the horizon and see if there's any clouds. Now, my personal opinion, the great product. Right now, it's at a great price, but what could happen? Well, if as demand increases and we don't have the supply, if the supply isn't produced domestically, the price may go up to make it unaffordable for us to use. That's one thing I'm worried about. The other thing is that. Um, some of the carbon intensities, that are, it's a very detailed but emerging body of work about determining the carbon intensity of a fuel. And it takes into account whether it's ethanol, biodiesel, everything, land use patterns, all those things that could possibly affect the carbon intensity of fuel. Like I said, when we're getting this stuff shipped from Singapore, then barge to Oregon, which doesn't sound like it's a very efficient process, all those carbon intensities are built into the carbon intensity that we're figuring our numbers on. So. Some of the feedstocks are kind of controversial. For example, palm oil. Palm oil plantations in Indonesia, where the majority of them are, are responsible for uh, destruction of the, the rainforest. So those type of carbon intensities are built into the, the uh, equations when we're looking at it. So we're hoping, and I've just read this morning a couple things, that we may be able to get a carbon intensities that are different for 
a more sustainable established palm oil plantation, whereas ones that aren't certified as green and sustainable where rainforest may be destroyed. So that's another thing that we're concerned about. The feedstocks really are uh, sustainable from a carbon intensity footprint. We're not just doing some greenwashing here. So price, demand, and the carbon intensities of all the feedstocks are the areas that I'm most concerned about. One last thing, Mr. Chair. And I know California gets used a lot as an example, but I'll remind us all they are the sixth largest economy in the world, and we aren't. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Bozovich. Thank you. So um, you had a little cost comparison between biodiesel mixes and the R99. What is the current cost of just regular diesel as produced from standard petroleum for, for a fleet like yours? So B5, we, we don't, we can't use uh, pure diesel in the state of Oregon. We use B5 as the mandated, the lowest you can use, uh, is $1.20 a gallon. That's okay. That's Wednesday is what we were using. So that's, that's what, if they, you were just pulling up at a truck stop, the you know, sa same fuel. Okay. That's correct. I just want to make sure I understood that, that there wasn't already a markup from, from the base fuel. Okay. Um, in the bio versus... Um, renewable process. Is there a difference in the yield you get from the, the feed uh, stock? You know, it, it's, it seems, you know, one of the things that it might make a difference in this whole thing is, is you know, you, you got a heat, a thermal cracking process in one, the other one's a, a catalytic process. Do you, do you get a higher yield of diesel out of one versus the other? I was afraid you were going to come up with questions like that, right? <laughs> and, I, and I knew it would be you. Uh, I'd have to check on that. Okay, that just topic. just uh, you know, curiosity thing because it's you know there's a limited amount of what people might consider um, the input right. to that. You know, and one of the reasons you know, so one of the things this is going to do is compete with biodiesel for that feedstock because it's almost the same thing you're talking about tallows, vegetable oils. Um, you know, that are going into this, it's just a different process of right. how you process them. So you end up with a higher energy content fuel, much more pure. Um, I, you know, I, I get all that. So um, is it, if, if this does become you know, a refinery in Washington doing it, are they going to experience the downtime switching between regular petroleum processing and renewable petroleum processing as, they're, you know, as they switch feedstocks and everything else, they're going to have to go through downtime for maintenance and all that. Is that something that you... you... Uh, again, I couldn't answer that okay. question. Because we, could... we all know how the price spikes every spring when they switch over to summer blends and they have to go to downtime before the switchover. And we get this little spike in our prices every spring that people, <laughs> in and every fall, when they switch back to winter as they down, as they go through downtime cycles in the, in the limited amount of refineries that serve the Northwest. Um, just kind of wondering if we're just going to add another, you know, as they stop and make some renewable diesel for a while and then go back to producing regular diesel because um, there's probably not enough, there's not enough renewable diesel to, to feedstock really to supply the entire. Feedstock would probably be the issue also. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just, yeah, just a couple questions there. And then I guess what if we, as we're moving towards this, is this going to displace sequential fuels and some other local biodiesel manufacturers and actually um, is there a, a, an economic displacement that may happen with, with the moving to this particular uh, fuel? My personal opinion is there will probably be some pushback. I think my battery has died. Is my mic still on? Wait, yeah, it does sound a little bit. Just take this swap a mic. I just move down. Come on down here. Yeah. You can just pull the mic back with you. You're good. You're on. It's on. They're all good. Try the other one. There you go. We'll share one. Sequential is right here in our community. Um, I spoke to them briefly a couple weeks ago, and they had some questions. I've heard that bio manufacturers may be concerned about this and there may be some pushback about that yeah I, and I can't remember whether the final version of the uh, energy bill that just went through the legislature in a short session 
included a preference for local production because there was there was a, an amendment that was that was floating around right right at the end and I can't remember whether well, that included I, I was on the uh, advisory committee for DEQ that wrote the rules for the clean fuels program back in 2009 which this last year was just uh, they were moved to sunset, so it, it's going to go in effect. And I'm getting a briefing on that in a couple of weeks, and I can provide you more information about the details. But I, I would like to say that in the fleet world, especially, we like to remain fleet neutral, or excuse me, fuel neutral. We don't care what what the we use. We just want the most economical. Uh, product with with the best uh, results for us, so that's where we are. We're not picking favorites, and I think it's important to, that people understand. One other area that I, I didn't mention that is kind of anecdotal, but we're seeing dramatic, and other fleet managers seeing it's the same thing, with increased uh, pollution control devices on diesel engines these days. We have quite a bit of downtime and very high maintenance costs cleaning the uh, that equipment out. Since we've been using this renewable diesel, the regen process that results uh, in the downtime and the maintenance costs has dropped to almost zero. So there are benefits to this that w we haven't proven yet because it's such new products so we need some more studies. But anecdotally, we're definitely seeing other benefits. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things I see as a benefit of this particular fuel stock is it definitely will decrease maintenance costs. Uh, I remember when Portland Water Bureau made its first jump into biodiesel, um, their fleet almost ended up completely off the road. Um, that's, that's correct. Because of maintenance uh, issues. They, they were <clears throat> politically directed to use a B99 blend in Ford diesel pickups that really couldn't handle it, and they they lost a lot of money. Yeah, and it wasn't just the pickups. They they lost money in their, their heavy dump trucks and other equipment. Well, that's why when I said uh, in general fleet managers aren't doing embrace new technology real quickly or new fuel because we know that the downside is, uh, could be very, very expensive. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I, and I really appreciate this work because it seems like it's it's a cost-effective way in in many ways of, of providing a, a great environmental benefit. Uh, and I particularly like the other reductions in, in NOx and, and everything else uh, that people are concerned about in diesel, particulate and diesel smoke. So thank you for the work on this. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, we have a, a number of other things besides, bio, besides the renewable diesel that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm just going to make a comment on your personal style. Um, you know, Mike, I, uh, I really appreciate the way you make a presentation. You, uh, you take a pragmatic approach, and you've mentioned that a couple of times right now regarding the future cost of the product, bearing that in mind as to how dependent we should be getting on it at this point in time until we can see... Uh, you know, what, what does the future look like? You also talked about the, some hostility that's out there toward the use of such products. Um, uh, you kind of brushed on that a little bit. Is that, did I catch that correctly? I, I wouldn't say hostility, but any time you're threatening somebody else's livelihood, mm -hmm. there, there might be a little pushback. Yeah. So that's why we like to remain neutral in, in this area, and we want to use the best product available mm -hmm. at the most economical cost mm -hmm. that has the greatest amount of uh, environmental impact. So that's where we're at now. We didn't see this we didn't see this on the horizon a year ago. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's just cropped up. Biodiesel was the best thing we had available to and but the the carbon intensity reductions we're seeing from biodiesel can't really compare to what we're using with the renewable diesel right now. Um, and we're looking forward to anything else that comes down the pipe we're willing to take a look at it also. Well, once again, I appreciate your approach to that, not looking at what looks great today, but what it's going to look like for the future and what is going to be the long-term impact beyond the time that you and I are sitting in these chairs. I'd like to point out that um, all those years ago when I hired you at Jerry's, I foresaw this greatness in your anal analytical ability, and, uh, and thank you I for what you bring to us. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much, and I uh, I know that our county administrator has taken the uh, effort to have uh, somebody put these uh, strategic plan overviews in in uh, some sort of plastic container there, so we can uh, use them for our coffee cups and other purposes. But also to re remind us that one of our uh, key objectives is to invest in a strong, diverse, and sustainable regional economy. So part of this effort is uh, certainly that, meeting that key objective. And uh, another one being to uh, maintain a safe infrastructure. And I would put the vehicles in that uh, 
generic category. So I, I do appreciate hearing more about how, and I especially like the comparison in terms of the impact on the environment uh, where you uh, compared the cost of shipping the fuel long distance, and that's got a, a cost. And also, I think uh, several people <coughs> here have commented on the the win-win uh, component of this, where if we're able to save wear and tear in our vehicles, which I know was a big concern about the uh, the uh, biofuel uh, mix, um, particularly in the winter, you know, we didn't get very good uh, numbers. I think that was shown also on the chart. And so this gives us, uh, uh, using this might work. <coughs> Have you looked into um, Have you looked into different types of vehicles? And I guess I'm thinking about the electric vehicles more uh, for the lower uh, intensity uses. Like we have a lot of single occupancy vehicle use um, in our fleet, and um, you know that could be everything from a giant truck, which is a single occupancy vehicle, but it could be also uh, a vehicle used to uh, go from one restaurant to another, to another, to another, uh, all within an urban space. So I'm just curious how much, um, how much down in the weeds have you gotten with maybe be cheaper to have um, restaurant inspectors uh, take a bus to the middle of Eugene and walk around and inspect restaurants. Maybe it'd be easier to have them take a bus to Springfield and do a bunch of sprinkles. And we wouldn't really need a vehicle. You'd be using a vehicle, but you wouldn't be checking one out. On the other hand, uh, maybe those restaurants are spread out a little more and you need to have a electric powered vehicle. If you looked into uh, the different, and then on the other end, the heavy vehicle, uh, it's got to have this, you know, uh, fuel that's going to meet uh, what I would call a diesel engine. I know that might be a outdated term pretty soon, but you know, that we'll need a different type of fuel. Right. That, well, thank you, Commissioner, because that segues nicely into some of the other areas we've been looking at. As far as the <clears throat> electric vehicles, we have some applications in the county where electric vehicles will be perfect, as you mentioned, for some types of inspectors. Maybe uh, HHS would probably have a lot of their caseworkers that are mainly in the uh, urban area. Um, although the range of electric vehicles is increasing rapidly, and now it's over 100 miles per charge for the new Nissan LEAF. Uh, and we're looking at those, and we've, we've had one plug-in electric hybrid that we've acquired a lot of data on and how we use it. The long pole in the tent right now is that is the charging infrastructure. So I've recently started having some conversations with Brian Craner about um, getting some more charging stations. We have them out at Public Works. We have four of them out there right now. But if we don't have any downtown other than the ones that are in the City of Eugene public garages, um, it won't be very convenient for people to use, and people aren't going to use things that aren't convenient. Um, but we might even need to uh, partner with our friends in Lynn County or Marion County and have a charging station. So when our employees go to Portland, uh, that's a possibility. Well, we don't. That's not even a problem anymore. The electric, the West Coast Electric Highway, if, has has electrified uh, most of the, at least the western part of the state, and you can get to Portland no problem now, or all the way up to Seattle. You'll have to charge a few times, uh, but you, but it can be done. So that's one of the things we're looking at. We're, we're going kind of slow as it, because it's, now we're talking about major financial investments to get charging infrastructure, always looking for grants, always looking for the cheapest way to do something, but that's one of the areas that we have to get taken care of before we move more large scale in the applications where it works. Now, as far as the larger vehicles, um, there's not really anything that's going to work for us in the way we do business right now. Things like uh, liquid petroleum don't work really well for us. Um, compressed natural gas, we've, we've looked at the cost for making our shop compliant as well as the fuel and infrastructure costs would be a lot more. One area we are looking at, we've had conversations with the sheriff's office about, and they went up to the Advanced Transportation Technology Center with us at Lynn Benton Community College where they have a great program, and that's converting uh, sheriff's patrol vehicles over to biofuel, gasoline, and propane. Propane being 
heavier than air. You don't have the same problems that you do with CNG, and we don't have to change our shop all around to work on them. They've tentatively agreed to that. They want to talk to some more people who have already switched over, like Benton County and a couple others that have done it. But it's real promising, especially for patrol vehicles that are such high. Not only is it environmentally more friendly, it's more economical, and there's an emergency management component, too, where we can use more than one fuel in case there's ever an emergency, because it's very possible that our liquid transportation fuel supply could be interrupted if we had some type of uh, Cascadia event here. So we're looking at all those things. The other, and while I'm on it, I might as well finish with the other thing that we're actually starting to make a lot of progress on, and that's downsizing the size of the fleet. When I'm talking downsize, I'm talking about the, the type of vehicle we give someone, where we've in the past given somebody, an inspector, a full-size Ford Explorer. We're now putting them in a compact crossover like a Nissan Rogue, which mileage is a lot better. So we're, people are starting to come on board with that. I'm really pushing that when we order new vehicles to get the smallest vehicle we possibly can to get the job done. Thank you. Want to move on to other topics? Or? Well, that, that's pretty much it. I've like what I've said. Uh, the, the different fuels that I just mentioned and the downsides in the fleet are the areas that we've been concentrating on the fleet. I don't know if you have any questions for the other members or the audience that are here for us in transportation plan and waste or um, capital projects. I did mention that Brian and I are going to be working on some hopefully in the future, seeing if there's any way we can shake loose some charging infrastructure for the county. But as far as what we're doing at Fleet, that about sums it up. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll be happy to ask our friends from uh, Waste Management a few questions. <coughs> Mr. Hurley? That one's on. Oh, well, now it's working, too. Good morning, Good morning. I'd be happy Welcome. To uh, well, my main question was, the last time we were here, there were fewer people in Lane County. Now there are more people in Lane County. Assuming we get more people, um, are we reducing the waste from that larger population? And how long will Short Mountain last? Just Our a few questions for you today. Sure. <laughs> we are. We have a goal of reaching 63% of recovery. We're currently a little over 50%, and so we have some plans to try to get there. We're going to be working through a major planning process to develop a solid waste master plan. That'll be a regional plan to help us get to that, and we'll be talking to you soon um, in April about that as we start that process. So I, I do believe that if we get to that higher level of recovery, we will be offsetting the increase in population growth. Um, waste generation dropped precipitously um, with the economic decline. Uh, since 2006, there was a sharp decline. And we've been slightly edging up the last couple of years, but, but pretty flat. Um, but if we're looking at larger population growth, we will need to be doing something to try to offset that. I've heard uh, waste um, experts say we will never uh, build a, another uh, landfill in Lane County <coughs> because of the recovery rates. Um, is that true? And if not, it, are we setting aside enough money in case we do need to build another uh, big facility like Short Mountain? Mm -hmm. So at current waste generation rates and some uh, moderate, slight to moderate growth, we have over 100 years of life at our landfill. So we're very fortunate here. Um, Douglas County. Um, it's in a very different situation looking to reach capacity in less than 10 years. So we have an opportunity to have a lot of time to try to figure out what is the next generation for waste. Um, I'm keeping a close eye on what's happening in California. Uh, the trend there is to move towards mixed waste processing facilities. So that's taking in um, not source separated recyclables, but is mixed into the garbage and, and there's technologies and sorting lines to, to pull out everything that can be recovered. And they're reaching close to 95% recovery with those systems right now. Um, they're, they're extremely expensive, um, but I, I hope they extremely expensive. Yeah. Um, but with new technologies, that's typically the case. And uh, I'm hopeful that as they refine those, that we can um, bring those costs down to something that's affordable here. There was a uh, delegation of British 
uh, garbage experts that came through Eugene a few years ago, and uh, Terry McDonald hosted them. And one of the things that they said in their talk was they were surprised that we didn't have uh, the because um, they'd heard so much about you know how how there was. Uh, you know, a good market here relative to other places in the U.S., a lot of public support for recycling, reuse. Um, they were surprised we didn't have single source, um, you know, recycling at the, at the residential level because they were getting such high rates of recovery of usable stuff out of the uh, waste system and that by having individuals uh, decide whether something is use, usable or not. Uh, you know, you're putting that that decision in the in the hands and mind of the person least educated about the value of the waste. And I notice uh, when I go to uh, Cafe Yum, as an example, locally, uh, they don't want me to separate my my tray. They don't want the food and the plastic or whatever materials there are, uh, they don't want me to separate. They want the workers there to separate right. because they're profiting from the, the, the waste and they're also benefiting from any uh, lower error rate on the part of uh, the, the consumer that's making the decision. Right. So I thought that's interesting to, to compare. I think that is the trend, that there's yeah. more separating on the back end. It, because recycling is complicated, materials keep changing, and it's, it's a hard message to get out of what is a recycling. It's not as bad as filing yeah. an income tax return, because <laughs> I have had a recent experience that's true. with that topic. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I, but I, it's I getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's getting there. Um, so really, there's no need at this point with a 100-year estimate, and we will hold you to that, and I'll be here in 100 years <laughs> to hold you to it. Uh, but, but we don't even really need to start a pool of money toward, uh, you know, the, the – uh, the new facility, if I'm going to call it that. I, I think we should start there, and I think one thing we should look at, and we'll talk about this in a future, future conversation with the board, is do we want to take waste from out of the county? So take what? Waste from out of county. So, with so Douglas, when Douglas County gets into a crisis correct. in, you know, probably eight years, they'll, they'll be going, oh, what are we going to do? Right. And they'll go, yeah. how about Lane County? It could either go to a, a private facility. Dry Creek would be the next closest or Lane County. So we've had a uh, historic stance of saying we don't take waste from out of county, but we may want to look at that differently. We're, we just completed a study with a uh, solid waste consulting firm, and they're going to bring those recommendations back to you on April 6th or 5th, um, whatever that Tuesday is. Um, and one of those recommendations is to look at taking waste from out of county, particularly D D Douglas County, with the uh, with the idea that because we have such large capacity to use that influx of cash into the system to help us get to the next generation of uh, waste um, processing. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Lincoln. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a question for Brian. I woke you up. No, I'm just <laughs> no. kidding. A uh, question for Brian. So on, on maybe in, uh, some of the cap capital future capital projects. So there, there seems to be a, a clearly a, I'm not going to say a push, but I'll, I'll just, for lack of a better word, a push uh, toward the uh, opportunity for what we call advanced wood products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if, if this is something you're, you're, you're paying attention to or, or staying on top of, but one of the, one of the things I, I thought of is, and especially this really came out, I mean, a year ago, I'm, you probably called me a little skeptical on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as we move now a year later, uh, and especially coming off the Oregon Logging Conference, I was pretty pretty interested, in, and I thought it was interesting that the industry now is beginning to embrace this opportunity as well. So we obviously need, have to uh, have a need to either build, do something with a new courthouse facility here. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that that's a potential of maybe being mentioned, or is that a potential that maybe could occur, that once the dollars are in place, that maybe cross-laminated timber could play a role in the building of a new courthouse right here in 
Yeah, I think I certainly think that's possible. I had the opportunity at a conference to attend some continuing education on the product, and uh, certainly the capabilities uh, are there and, and evolving to a point where they can match other structural systems, steel or concrete. I was also at the logging conference yeah. and met with some of the Oregon State students, and there's a lot of um, funding coming towards the two universities to really put Oregon at the forefront of that right. technology. So I think there's um, some great opportunity there with it in our backyard to really um, – Take that on it as uh, you know at the forefront of the effort. Again, it's an evolving technology, it is. Um, and so you don't want to get too far out at the tip of the spear and, and get too experimental, especially with something um, with this, as critical uh, infrastructure as a courthouse. But um, as we look at the design of that, uh, we certainly explore all possibilities. I think that would be um, you know if the technology supports it, it would be a great opportunity to partner, especially with the two universities at the forefront. I'll be curious to see the the the. Uh, it's, it's somewhat of a pilot project here in the Pearl District. That's, yeah. uh, I'll be curious to see how that, how that uh, not only during the construction phase, but maybe after a five-year period. I, right. that's, that's, I think, will be the most interesting is how it hold, holds up during, after this period of time. Uh, I know it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's commonly used in Europe and mm -hmm. has been for the last, I think, what, couple decades? Is that right, Faye? Yeah, so the last couple dec decades. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. But I, I think it's a really golden opportunity. And I did, I have seen where our, our and it's great that our, our delegation back in D.C. Has, has looked at this and making sure that some of that federal funding is flowing into both Oregon State and University of Oregon. Because, I, you know, if it's not going to come into Oregon, where is it going to go? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. I mean, this, should, this really should be the... If there's going to be a catalyst for it, or it should be here in the state of Oregon. So that's and that was my question for you, and because I, you know, looking at it, uh, like I said a year ago, call me a skeptic. Mm -hmm. uh, a year later, probably a little bit more interested to see see where this goes. And there's and there's hybrid systems where you, we could feature components of CLT sure. along with other structural systems. And uh, yeah, at the Oregon Logging Conference, I was speaking with the folks from Oregon State there, and they're showing the renderings of the new lab. And right. certainly, it's going to be a big push to develop those standards and really explore the capabilities. So, um, you know, with the timeline that a new courthouse would be on, um, we could be in a completely different position in another few years when we're making those key Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking, because yeah. obviously it's not happening tomorrow. Right. And, but it's moving uh, quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but given that if the dollars are in place, I mean, mm -hmm. and then you have a timeline of construction, then that's – That'll kind of tell us if if this is going to be available or not, mm -hmm. and and if this this could be a possibility. Because, you know, not only would I, obviously, the most interesting and the and the best practice was to make sure the courthouse is is efficient and effective in in being a courthouse. Mm -hmm. But it'd also be kind of fun to have it as a showcase mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. Um, but number one is making sure that it's actually a, a, a user-friendly mm -hmm. operation. Showcase comes second, but uh, mm -hmm. but it would be interesting. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Bozovich. Thanks. Before we leave that topic, I'll just note that cross-laminated timber, for those that don't know what CLT is, um, thank you. It is, has a carbon footprint that's several, you know, multiple, you know, orders of 10 below standard concrete and steel construction. So, you know, when we start talking about what we're doing environmentally, it's by far a superior product environmentally. Um, and, and I just, you know, Brian, I want to thank you for your past efforts on other projects. Um, you know, we've talked about them before in other meetings, but mm -hmm. the amount of energy savings we've achieved in almost everything we've done from, you know, upgrading our um, IT server room to uh, even what we did with, with remodeling the, uh, the county administration and county council and HR areas of this building. Every time we do something, we wrap in energy conservation and, and not only does it help in cost savings, but it also decreases um, our footprint in the world. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. I want to jump back to um, solid waste a little bit. With the decline of the Chinese economy, um, the recycled uh, material market has just about fallen to pieces, and, I, and it's having a, a really impact on the, you know, our ability to get rid of recycled material, okay. and it's caused us to change our pricing structure to haulers, and then there's been threats by haulers to stop picking up glass because it's the heaviest recycled material. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that's um, – 
impacting our ability to try and divert some of this material right now? Sure. I mean, you, you pretty much summed it up, though. I, that's that's We're looking at a global issue of just uh, economic slowdown. And with recyc the cost, people need to remember there's a cost to recycling. Um, recycling is, there, it is a waste product. And so it takes energy to collect that material, clean it, process it, and turn it back into a new usable material. Um, and that often doesn't um, pencil out when we're looking at um, virgin materials, but it depends on where you draw that environmental bubble <laughs> there and the cost bubble, you know, who, whose problem it is, uh, if that makes sense. Um, there are still many environmental benefits of, of, of doing recycling, but it's mostly upstream, so we won't see it at a, at a local level. Um, and at DEQ could go into a much better explanation of that. But I don't want, I want people to realize that they should continue recycling, but there is a cost to recycling. And, and it, there, it, that cost is increasing with the economic slowdown. There's just not the demand for these recyclable materials as there were. Um, I'm hoping that we, that will change and we go through you know, swings and cycles. Um, but we should be looking at it on a local level of where we can develop processing facilities and develop um, demand for these materials. But yes, that is impacting the haulers. Um, they're having to pay a significantly higher price to get their recyclables to market. Yep. I will say it has helped the metal theft problem. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and just because he's here, and I don't want to leave transportation out of this whole conversation, um, but one of the things, and, I, and I'm not going to make you come up, I'm just going to speak just generally about, we are in the process of um, revising and upgrading our transportation system plan for the entire county. And as a part of that effort, we're looking at, um, you know, there's an effort through the mayors um, and LCOG to look at how we can interconnect communities better for bicycle uh, routes and even um, lo more locally um, to provide more opportunities for active transportation. And I'm meeting with the, uh, some representatives of the Santa Clara Community Organization on Saturday where we're, they're going to take me on a tour of where they'd like to see some improvements in their neighborhoods that would make it a lot easier to utilize uh, a bicycle versus an automobile in their, in their neighborhoods. So there are efforts underway um, beyond waste management, beyond our, our buildings, beyond our fleet, and just our policies and our transportation planning to get active transportation um, a bigger part of the picture in Lane County transportation. And we, you know, anytime you can get on a bicycle versus get in a car, um, there's quite an environmental impact. And, and there's a great health benefit that goes along with that. So just wanted to, to bring that into the conversation. Other questions or comments? Well, <clears throat> I guess I would like to thank each of you for being here today. I mean, this is just a small little touch of the things that you've been doing. I mean, sitting on the facilities committee and understanding the work that uh, Mr. Craner has been doing in uh, upgrading facilities, <coughs> uh, the cost savings alone and, and energy use reduction in our IT department, I think it's saving us 60000 mm -hmm. Uh, a year? Yeah, it was. It was the facility itself was saving 69 percent, 69 percent reduction in energy year over year once we completed the upgrades. Yeah, and the, and we didn't even talk about it in waste management, but the, you know, upgrading our technology to be able to capture the methane more efficiently as um, up the production of uh, electricity from the gas that we've been capturing. So, you know, the all of the work. I mean, we you guys haven't touched probably just a little bit on the on the great things that you're doing or in transportation, the scenario planning and understanding, you know, a few tweaks here and there, the uh, being able to reduce our impact to the transportation system too. So I want to thank each of you for being here today and, and uh, having this as a uh, kind of a uh, update on the great work that each of you are doing in your respective departments to, to recognize uh, that we do have an impact on our environment and we want to reduce that as much as possible. So thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, on to item 11, which is commissioner's business. Do we have uh, announcements? Mr. Bozovich? Thank you. I've got two announcements, and they're both about events coming up on Friday. 
Um, I'm going to be um, taking part in the tsunami walkout um, on Friday at 1030 at City Hall in Florence. Uh, Congressman DeFazio is going to be there uh, and several other um, elected representatives where we are going to talk a little bit about the, the national efforts to set up an early warning system in, in off the coast of Oregon as well as what's being done locally where they're painting blue lines across roadways and signing uh, areas where you know you're above the tsunami level so people can really understand um, where they are safe once they once the tsunami sirens have gone off. So that's going to be happening Friday uh, at 1030 and then the sirens will go off at 11 and everybody's going to participate in walking out uh, to the safe blue line. And then also that same day I'll be uh, participating in a dunes restoration meeting with the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, sites on National Forest. I know I was a little bit critical of them earlier in the meeting, but I will make note that um, there are several places they've been working very collaboratively uh, with local governments and, and stakeholders. And, you know, we can look at Archie Knowles Campground as one of those collaborative efforts that we've already participated in. But the dunes restoration effort has been an interesting thing where you're bringing together very disparate um, stakeholder groups. You've got the riders of the dunes that like to make use of it for off-road vehicles and camping and other activity, recreational activities. And then there's quite an environmental uh, interested group that wants to, you know, preserve the, the dune environments for snowy plover and other endangered and threatened species. Um, they're working together with the Forest Service on this effort because all of them recognize that there's an invasive species, European beach grass, that's threatening to completely wipe out the dunes environment in the next 50 to 100 years at the current rate of progression of that invasive species. And without that open sand, there's no place to ride your OHV and there's no place for snowy plovers to nest. So it's a, a great work that they've done. Uh, getting a lot of support from Senator Merkley's office. Dan Whalen's been attending these meetings, uh, looking at ways they can pilot some restoration projects and maybe go to, to more broader scale. But it kind of points to the whole issue of trying to control invasive species in Oregon and how they can be a threat to everyone's recreation and environmental values. And, and I would say that the Forest Service has been doing a great job with that, and they're looking to move ahead with some of their first pilot projects in some of that restoration of the native environment there, of open sand, and it will be an interesting effort there. So just wanted to let the board know about those two, two particular things going on on Friday. Okay. Others? Mr. Parr? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you know, Ms. Markarski, we have lots of committees that uh, meet and meet and meet and meet, and every now and then committees do sunset, uh, contrary to what seems like uh, the, the norm. Uh, two committees that I've been chairing over the last uh, year plus are in the process of sunsetting currently. Uh, last week, we uh, sunsetted the, the work of the Poverty and Homelessness Board Veterans Housing Subcommittee. Last Friday was our last meeting. However, the work continues from that committee, and we're, uh, we have a, not a new charge, but a new focus of, uh, of how we're going to proceed from this moment forward with the veterans with the uh, work that we achieved in the Veterans Homelessness Committee. Um, you know, we, uh, we managed Operation 365 and housed 404 homeless veterans, but that does not leave every veteran in Lane County who is homeless um, with, a, with a home. So uh, we left with three uh, ongoing projects that we're working on, not as a committee because we have indeed sunsetted, but we are uh, uh, going to make certain that the people who participated in Operation 365 receive thanks. Uh, the mayor and I are writing a letter to all of the landlords, for instance, who uh, provided housing to the homeless veterans throughout, the, throughout Operation 365, and other thanks to the different uh, uh, groups and people who are involved in uh, making Operation 365 successful, and in fact making the uh, work of the Veterans Housing Subcommittee successful. We're going to be monitoring ongoing the number of veterans who are homeless in Lane County and making certain that we're continuing to work on our goal of uh, eliminating veterans homelessness in Lane County. Operation 365 met its goals, but it did not fully and completely eliminate homelessness, homeless veterans in Lane County. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a difficult task because continually every month we report new homeless veterans who have moved into Lane County. And the third thing that we're going to be working on is, uh, is uh, the lessons that we learned during Operation 365, how can we 
transfer the lessons we learned housing homeless veterans to housing other homeless segments of our community. Some of the things that we did are fully transferable, not only within our own community, but as I've reported before, other communities are looking at the way Eugene and Lane County did it um, as far away as uh, Tucson. And, uh, and even even beyond, are uh, taking taking a look, good hard look at how we actually were successful in the effort. So the uh, while the committee is sunsetted, the work is ongoing in housing homeless veterans. The other committee that is almost ready to sunset is the uh, the um, perf the temporary performance auditor committee. Just a, a note that uh, we will be uh, conducting interviews for the the permanent audit committee on. Uh, it's going to be happening on April 13th is the scheduled date for interviewing the applicants for the permanent committee. And uh, Commissioner Lycan and I continue to work on that. Uh, it's not sunset, but it certainly is dusk. And, uh, <laughs> so we're, uh, we're moving forward with uh, making, getting the permanent committee in place. So thanks very much for everybody's support in making sure that those two committees did uh, complete their charges in a very effective fashion. Thank you. <clears throat> I have uh, one announcement uh, to just remind folks that uh, this Friday at uh, 10 a.m. in Coburg on Industrial Way, Serenity Lane will be doing a ribbon cut in, cutting of their brand new facility and also giving tours. Uh, I've had a little preliminary tour uh, during the construction phase, and it's very exciting uh, this new facility being opened. Uh, I look for it to be a um, facility It's definitely on the leading edge in um, treatment for addictions and I see it as a, a facility that's going to bring other providers in our community together to offer um, uh, training on evidence-based practices and being able to really connect and, and help folks uh, with addiction issues in our community and actually throughout the entire state. So if you have an opportunity to come see this uh, world-class uh, facility be opened up uh, this Friday the 11th at uh, 10 a.m. Please uh, put it on your calendar. Okay. So seeing no further announcements, we'll go to agenda team requests and or, and or work session requests. Do we have commissioners have requests today? Commissioner Bozovich? I'm not sure if this is actually an agenda team request, but with the meeting on Thursday night on the um, Indian Creek um, Landscape Management Plan, the public comment period ends, um, I, I believe it's the end of this month. We may have opportunity to comment as a board or I could just comment as an individual. Um, it's kind of up to the board if they want to be involved in commenting on that management plan and establishing um, that we're a stakeholder. Uh, particularly, you know, as we look to ask for um, the the cooperation from federal agencies as they develop plans within Lane County. So I, I didn't know if we want to put that as a as a possible um, future agenda item later in the month, where we might have an opportunity to develop a set of comments. Um, seeing heads head shake, but it would be good to, at a minimum, Commissioner, if you would. Um, uh, bring to the board what you learn this next week, uh, next Tuesday, and then um, uh, if the board chooses to uh, give direction on uh, on uh, writing some comments, then we'd have time to do that before the end of the month for our last meeting. So, yeah, there's some some very I think uh, great parts of the plan where they're looking at adding large wood to some of the streams for uh, fish habitat restoration, but there's some other issues that I think we'd like to comment on, particularly the access issues. Okay. All right, so we'll look forward to a report next uh, next Tuesday on what you hear and, and your recommendations. Anything else? Okay. So we do have an executive session, but uh, I guess before we do a review of assignments, item 12. Um, the, <clears throat> we will work with the representatives from Caring Hands to identify the discounted rate for the um, uh, facility at Lane Event Center and then uh, work on identifying the resources necessary to cover that and process that payment. So that's one. And then two is the request that was just made. Um, we'll add an item to our, our working list of um, assignments uh, that Commissioner Bozovich will report back on what he learns on Thursday and then the board can uh, direct us to provide comments if you would like. 
okay. on the Indian Creek management plan. Okay. Is there anything else? All right. So we have a, a time certain executive session that's this afternoon at 1.30. I think I'll go ahead and read the um, uh, executive session um, and bring us into executive session and then uh, the conclusion of that we will recess until 1.30 when we'll open in executive session. So with that, the uh, Board of Commissioners will meet in executive session, session to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations and to consult with Council concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. The executive session is held pursuant to ORS 192.660, subsection 2, subsection D, and H, which allows the Board of Commissioners to meet in executive session for the purposes listed above. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All of the members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decisions will be made in executive session and we will reserve the right to uh, come back out into public session should the need arise. Commissioner Sorensen. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have an estimate on the executive session today? Yeah, it's um, actually going to be uh, potentially lengthy. It looks like it's close to two hours. Okay. So, so one to four isn't unreasonable as an estimate. One thirty to four. One thirty to three thirty-four. Yeah. Probably. Thank you very you much. Okay. So with that, uh, no further questions. We will uh, recess until 1.30 and meet up at the uh, Board of Commissioners Conference Room.